Box, Episodes of Horror with Donna and Eric. I'm Donna. And I'm Eric. And tonight we're doing Texas HawthorCon and Book Festival interviews with Eric and myself. Um, so, yeah, we're getting ready to have uh, Texas HawthorCon in July. So we're doing some interviews again. And we got a new set of questions for people that have been interviewed before. Um, so, Eric, tell me, what's your favorite Universal monster? Well, it's a tough one because I like the Wolfman and the Mummy. Those are probably my two favorites. The Creature from Black Lagoon, I like that movie a lot. Um, but if I mean gun to head, I'd probably say the Mummy. I do enjoy those movies. I'm not yeah. a fan of the original two, which we've already kind of discussed because we did the Frankenstein yeah. and Dracula. But I do enjoy the Wolfman, but I I think the Mummy's iconic and i enjoy all the reincarnations that they've done yeah which you can't say the same for wolfman so mm. yeah i'm gonna i'd have to say my two favorites are frankenstein and the wolfman um i don't know i just really like the frank even though the movie you know i had mm-hmm. mixed thoughts on the movie itself the actual creature in the movie was pretty decent um, yeah it's iconic and, and yeah. yeah it's a great character i always i think i always fall back on just the movie itself i know i i enjoy the mummy as a movie way more than i did frankenstein so but you're right the frankenstein character is amazing yeah, yeah. and then the wolfman i mean you gotta love the wolfman <laughs> you go back and watch it and it's i think it still holds up even the special mm-hmm. effects and stuff i know it's old school stuff but it's fun to watch and and um you know he's charismatic as the main character, and, and then I enjoyed the remake with the, uh, you know Benicio del Toro or whatever. Um, it's not a perfect movie, but I don't think it's a bad movie. Right. But like I don't, I don't, I don't really care for the Jack Nicholson Wolf one, and I don't care. But I, you know, but I guess I did like the other thing I like to balance Universal with is did I enjoy the Hammer production when they redid them? you know, on color for the first time. And I think the mum is a better film with uh, Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee than, than Wolfman is, even though I do enjoy that movie too. So it's really tough. I would probably pick those two as the, the ones, but, but Frankenstein's tough because he's such an iconic, cool character that we already have in our head. But then when yeah. we rewatched all the movies, most of them fell short because they weren't matching what we had in our head as, right the character so um, yeah and i oh boy a beautiful movie is from the black lagoon it's not near as scary as it could be but it's it's a very beautiful reshot if you watch it in high definition it's it's really smooth so i do enjoy that too yeah i mean as as a whole i think the universal monsters are all great you know in their own ways um because they are so iconic and they're like the beginning of you know horror cinema mm-hmm. um, makes you wonder why they can't get their act together and give us a new you know they can relaunch the universe and they fumbled it at every turn so but wouldn't that be cool to have a universal monster universe that had all these movies that kind of did like marvel and intertwined and had the same actors and stuff i think yeah. that would be really fun yeah that would be cool um but it is what it is and you know, we need some new stuff, but the old stuff is good too. I know. Sitting here thinking, I'm like, ah, oh, but I, how could I forget the Invisible Man? Those, those that movie's really good too. And, um, yeah. So you're right. It's all the characters are just so iconic. Um, it's hard not to to love all of them, even yeah. on the ones that we didn't particularly enjoy. Uh, viewing the way the movie, I mean, the memory of them has all been something of our childhood, growing up and stuff. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So what about zombies? Do you prefer fast or slow zombies? I think I like fast better. Um, But that's, you know, that's one of those weird things because you go back and you could still Night of the Living Dead. They're all any Romero zombies slow and that has its own meaning. And you can kind of, especially now as an an older adult, you can kind of see where, where he was going with that. But then uh, there's something about 
going outside and having a zombie sprint at you, that makes me think that would be 10 times scarier. So, yeah. So is that why you say fast zombies? Cause they're more scary. I think so. Yeah. But yeah. what do you think? Well, I prefer slow zombies only because yeah. I think I would have more of a chance of getting away from a slow, there you go. <laughs> slow yeah, zombie. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but then you got to think they don't ever give up and they're just coming at you, coming at you. Even if they're coming slow, they're still coming at you. So yeah, just eventually they'll wear you down. Yeah. yeah. But do you watch like World War Z and um, 28 Days Later, even though that's technically not really a zombie, more like a rage or whatever. But the fact that, I mean, they run at you and they attack you and... I just think that that would probably be that that's more entertaining as a, yeah. As a but yeah, you're right. I definitely would rather have slow ones coming after me. Cause walking, uh, walking dead, they're all slow. Yeah. I think. So and then yeah. they're just coming as hordes and never ending. And one of my favorite games to play is days gone and they're fast zombie kind of like creatures that, that can chase down motorcycles and stuff. And I find that to be 10 times more fun than trying to play one of the zombie games where the zombies are slow moving around yeah. and stuff. Yeah, I mean, yes, fast zombies are more terrifying. Absolutely. Um, that's one of the things I not hated, but scare me the most about the newer Night of the Living Dead. Because those zombies were fast and they're like, they had like these horrific screeches. That I remember there's one scene this like zombie screeched and then it like took off running towards the, I think it was when they were trying to get the truck out of the bay doors or whatever. Uh but yeah, I just think about my own survival. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Put it that way, then I for sure would like Walking Dead. Because in the end, Walking Dead pretty much tells us that it's not really the zombies you have to worry about. It's the other humans. And it's the other humans. Stuff. Yeah, so. for sure. Um, yeah, everybody's trying to to survive. So they're going to do what they have to do. And definitely would be more afraid of the humans than the zombies. Yeah. So my um, favorite zombie movie or, um, is... And I don't know if it's technically a zombie movie, but Night of the Comet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is kind of a zombie movie. At different, I think it is. Yeah, um, but I just love that. It it's so much fun. Um, you know, it's from the era from the eighties. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it's got the great music. The scene in the mall is like my favorite, where she's got like the the Uzi. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's like it's very you know, iconic. Yeah, and it, it is definitely eighties. That mm -hmm. movie is everything that that was fun about the eighties kind of thrown in your face. I haven't seen that movie in so long, and I need to put that on my to do list. Yeah, we my favorite do a zombie thing. Yeah, my favorite thing was the end where the sister, the blonde sister, comes across the guy who she was beating, who or who who kept beating her in scores on that video game. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought that was so funny. I'm like, oh, that's so cool that she's, you know, now she's found the other last man on earth, you know? <laughs> yeah. I am. You know, what's funny is if I sit here and say, what are my favorites? The two I would pick are both slow zombies. So I don't know. Maybe I'm just talking out of my, my butt. But <laughs> Shaun of the Dead is hilarious and a great. Oh, movie. my gosh. Yeah. Shaun of the and, Dead. Uh, and uh, Return of the Living Dead. I mean, I, I remember sitting in the theater and being blown away about how funny it is. And it's got so many iconic things and they're slow. Tar Man coming out of the thing. and Just a nice uh, play on um, the zombie George Romero thing, but done in a way that was so tongue in cheek. And, you know, they're calling in, but they, and they're also smart. So they they started to talk and plan and organize. And that's kind of, that, that might be scarier than fast as a zombie that could, make you know plans to take you down yeah so. yeah the i really enjoyed that show is it called i zombie about oh, yeah the, yeah the, i think yeah. she was a coroner or something yeah i and yeah was, i read the comics and don watched the show i don't yeah yeah i didn't watch the whole series i only watched like maybe the first season um i just thought it was interesting that she's this you know she still retains her humanity even though she's a zombie you know, I did, thought that was. Did you ever fun. see Warm Bodies? That was a zombie movie. If I did, it I only watched it once, and it was so long ago that I don't. That's remember. another one where they they have the the thing where they they the, the mythos is that the zombies can come back, and they'd still be a zombie, but they would become more human as the more that humans 
gave them attention and affection and all that kind of stuff. And so a zombie and this woman fall in love. It's got the Nicholas Holt as the main character and it's before he got really big, I guess, but it's really, it's a good, it's a good one to watch. It's an interesting take on it. Yeah. You know, he goes from not being able to talk and just grunting to making sentences and stuff. So kind of like Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny. I wish we would have waited and been able to watch the, the, the one. What is it? Uh, Emma Stone's in it. It just came out. Uh, that's basically Frankenstein. Um, all the pretty things or something like that. Oh, yeah. Who was nominated for some Oscars. It's basically the story of Frankenstein. It's just the girl instead of, of him building a, a man monster. So, But that would have been an interesting thing to, to have to against the ones we did watch. Yeah. To kind of get now, a, a new world look. Now, would you consider Frankenstein a zombie? Even though he does, isn't brains, he's yeah. a reanimated corpse. So do you think that technically true. that would make him a zombie? Well, I guess it's not because I guess we were supposed to believe he's alive, right? Mm, so that yeah. he's actually life reincarnate. So he technically wouldn't be a zombie because he's he's back to life. And he's he'd be more, I you know, not to cause a ruckus here, but he'd be more Christ-like in his mm. return, you know resurrection yeah then he would a normal zombie would but yeah i mean i guess all the undead at some point i guess we could technically a vampire there you're feeding on but there's got to be something that specifically you know says a zombie is you know whatever and i guess could if we wanted to we could go and look at voodoo and all that stuff and like uh, serpent the rainbow and all that yeah. that's zombies too and that's but that's a totally different kind you know it's mm-hmm especially the way it was kind of uh, witchcraft and magic and drugs to make them appear to be dead like but they really weren't they're just kind of mindless yeah now did that terrify you when the serpent and the rainbow came out i remember it was like a big thing like this is real there is actually you know voodoo priests and priestesses mm-hmm. that could make you like a you're dead but you're not dead yeah like, we're buying ter- the book and seeing the movie in the theater that came out in 87, so we, we would have been, what, 13, something yeah. like that, 12, 13. That's perfect age, too, to be convinced that it's real. Yeah. yeah. So, I know I remember thinking, yeah, this is crazy. I don't want to – I wouldn't want to be dealing with any of that. That and the believers really mm-hmm. made me very hesitant to you know, approach voodoo or, or you know, people that yep. – if somebody was to say, hey, they're voodoo, I'd be on the other side of the street gone because those two movies, those, yeah, they messed with me a lot. Yeah. Because you know, because it's more grounded in realities. Yep. And and you see it kind of before you. Now, Serve of the Rainbow. I remember uh, trying to get the poster from the guy on the base after they showed it there. You know, trying to get the movie poster because I thought the movie poster was so cool. Yeah. It's funny yeah, if you have you watched it recently. Not recently, and talking about it, I'm like, I really want to watch that. <laughs> it plays more like a like an HBO movie. Like, uh, not a horror movie at all. It's more like a pharmaceutical movie. Mm. And, and, you know, all that, I don't, you know, of course we're 13. I didn't pick up on all these little right. things, but you watch it now and it's like, oh, this is complete. I mean, this is almost even more grounded in reality and more terrible because it's all the you know, it's pharmaceutical companies trying to find this wonder drug and stuff. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't remember that at all. I just remember voodoo and the guy doing all the crazy stuff and, and, yeah. uh, What's his name? Bill Pullman. I'm not dead or whatever. Don't bury me. Yeah. I remember that a lot. That, yeah. All that stuff messed with me as a kid. That was great. And I know a great Wes Craven. It's a, it's a fun, that's one of those movies where Wes Craven totally steps outside the box. It's still a technical horror movie, but it's nothing like any of his slashers. And it's such a smart movie. And it's just kind of cool. And you know, he does that. He did that music movie too. Um, there's a movie about a music school or teachers trying to get money for music. It's directed by Wes Craven. It came out like in the nineties and it totally just doesn't make any sense when you look at his, his, you know, filmography. And then there's this weird thing. I feel like <laughs> Serpent the Rainbow kind of fits that because at the time he was doing primarily slashers and this is totally different than that. So it's just kind of nice when he steps outside the box and gives us something that maybe we're not expecting from him. Right. Right. Now, do you have a favorite um, cryptid or creature? Well, I got to say, Pope, you know, goat man. So, Pope, like, yeah. yeah. But I've always been fascinated with them Bigfoot and Yetis and 
I mean, I guess isn't Nessie considered a, a cryptid? Yeah. yeah. Just any of those weird things where there's legends that there's something exists in a place where the humans are or near where humans are. Or if you take a step back and say, well, where humans have visited, you know, that there's these creatures and stuff. Um, you know, I've always found it fascinating, which is why I think I gravitated towards Pope Pope Lick and the and the Pope Lick monster as much as I did, because I just really thought it was a fun cool story and it's in a place where i you know you could easily get to and i know people that have actually been there and stuff so yeah. what about you what's your favorite so my favorite cryptid is one that nobody ever talks about and i never can say it it's the wolpy wolpinter let me let me look it up and make sure see if i can get the that's not the totem one is it wolf wolpertinger it's um Made up of the body of a squirrel, the feet of a rabbit, antlers, and the wings of a pheasant. And it lives in the Bavarian um, forests, so in Germany. And basically what it does, it's not like something that will attack you, like mm -hmm. Bigfoot or Mothman or whatever. Um, it lures tourists into the forest to get lost and starve. Oh, well, that's not nice. Yeah. So it, nobody ever talks about it because it's not like a violent cryptid. Mm -hmm. You know, you got Bigfoot and you got the the Chupacabra and, the, you know, uh, the Dogman. Um, and they're all violent kind of cryptids. But the Wolf Wolpertinger <laughs> is like a passive cryptid, but it mm -hmm. still will try to kill you. Yeah, and yeah. it's not very big with nope. that description. So yeah, no, nope, it's just like a a little, you know, it's almost like a jackalope, but not really. Yeah. Does it run in packs or is it by itself? Oh, uh, it's but usually by itself. So you get okay, that's like, even you know. that's interesting too. It'd be an interesting story. I don't think I've ever actually heard of that one. It's never yeah. popped up in any of the ones that I've been when I do research and try and find new creatures and stuff. Yeah, it's uh, that's because usually when you're looking for cryptids, like a lot of the cryptids are based in the U.S. with the exception mm -hmm. of Loch Ness, of, you know, of Nessie, um, because, you know, Sasquatch is in, you know. The, I guess the Yeti would be outside the U.S., Yeti, but, it's, yeah. but it's a cousin of Bigfoot. Of, so. of Bigfoot, yeah. 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 No, that's cool. Yeah, I think Europeans, I mean, like the, there's something in waters based on an Irish cryptid. Um you know, giant otter dog with the wolf's head that comes out of the water and eats people. And I thought that was fascinating. And I didn't understand why more people don't talk about that. The Dubu, Dubu Shur, I think is what it is. Okay. I'm sure, yeah. I'm, I'm sure I'm murdering the pronunciation, but yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, they, they have some interesting ones too. But yeah, a lot of times when we look at European cryptids, they're more mythical beasts because they're, they've been around for so long. But yeah. I mean, technically we could say dragons and, ogres and all those kind of things would be a cryptid in its own way yeah. if we wanted to but we think of them as more fantasy or or, or however you want to look at it because of of the the age of the tale i think yeah but yeah you're right the united states it's crazy how many cryptids we have and it's funny how many we have that kind of duplicate there's there's a handful of goat men Jersey Devil. There's a couple things that look like the Jersey Devil in different places. There's yeah, you all have Sasquatch and the Skunk Ape. Yeah, down yeah, in Florida. I mean, there's, and yeah. a, there's a Bigfoot in Texas, and there's a you know the Bigfoot in the Northwest, uh, and you've got the one up in Canada, and then we, there's more than one Nessie-like being in um, in the United States lakes. There's at least four or five that. I can yeah, Champ in Lake yeah. Champlain. Um, is the one one I know about that's here. In and I'm US. surprised we don't have more alien based um cryptid kind of stuff too, but I mean I guess it's probably it's its own thing, but you would think some of the the, the vastness of the states would lend itself to more alien horror stories, but other than a yeah. few abductions in a couple areas, it doesn't seem like it's that big. So Yeah. I love if cryptids, they're great. I do too. Any you kind know. of monster creature, you know, it's really fun that there's there so many of them out there and there's different ways, different takes. You know, everybody's – it's interesting to watch people write different ideas, you know, from the legends and how they twist and turn things. And 
So, yeah, I think if you put a monster in, in a movie or a book, it's usually a good thing for me. Yep, exactly. I love a, a good kaiju. Like, who doesn't love Godzilla? Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. Um, my favorite kaiju, though, has to be from um, Abhorrent Faith from John Baltusberger. He did a kaiju axolotl. Oh, yeah? It was so cool the way he wrote that. Um, that is cool. Yeah, so I just love all kinds of creatures. You know, I grew up on uh, Godzilla movies. Yeah, I did too. King Kong, Godzilla. Yep. Just, you know, everything about them were great. And then we get into the, and it might be because we discussed all those 70s monster books, and or not monsters, but we, all the fiction and how it was so adult and so um, clinical almost, you know, everything was a haunting and it was always, you know, like we read Exorcist, it was like reading a doctor's man, you know, mm -hmm. but we grew up on all those great 70s creature features that would pop up on the weekends on the, you know, USA Today and or whatever it was USA. You know, do you remember that? When I remember the, USA. Yeah, they would do the horror marathons where all day Saturday was just horror movies, and it was always like the food of the gods with the giant animals eating people, and then you had the Night of the Leapers, which was the rabbits killing people, and mm -hmm. I mean, all those movies came out in the seventies. Giant, you know, bugs, and and we got to enjoy all of that. So we kind of grew up on that. That, and yeah. I think when everybody was being hotty toddy with the more mature adult style theater horror stuff we were getting to consume both sides of it so right and i think it kind of it helps us as uh, especially today we have a much broader idea of what horror could be and it's not all going to be you know those sophisticated movies that they were giving us rosemary's baby and all that nonsense so yeah uh usa that channel i mean kids oh it was I mean, the best <laughs> i guess you could say it was the tubi before tubi because you get no control over it but blocks of cartoons three four hours a night you yep. would get that and tnt before tnt went crazy and only started playing what was it law and order get all those cartoons but then they would do just blocks of movies and you might get two three four movies in a row that were somehow connected but they were like really cool horror movies or action movies and of course they're added in but yeah you know when you're a young kid that's still got some pretty cool things yeah I, could, I love sitting down in front of usa and watching those all day mm -hmm. usa it was it was the best back in the day you didn't have it at your fingertips you couldn't just yep. go watch what you wanted to you had to actually sit there and suffer through some terrible movies to finally get to the one that if you were lucky you knew was coming on because you had tv guide or Yep. Or the newspaper, you know. Or the you newspaper. <laughs> the kids yep. today, they just like type in a search thing and then they get 70 different places they can go watch movies about whatever they just search for. So, and then you got to hope that you're in a household with two TVs because otherwise your oh, parents yeah. Yeah. aren't going to let you watch, you know, they're going to watch what they want to watch. Yeah. That was the cool thing about Sundays and, and being in a single parent family because my, my mom would work. So I would have the whole day to do whatever I wanted to Saturday, no school. She's working and I could just watch horror movies or whatever, science fiction. Cause that's the other thing that's really cool. I mean, and some of those will bleed into horror, but you know, there's so many great cheesy science fiction movies and creatures that we got, we grew up on. So. Yeah, it was a rare thing. And, and so uh, growing up, we did have two TVs. We had one in the living room, one in my parents' bedroom. So on the weekends, if my mother wasn't watching Ben Hur, which we watched a million times um, in the living room, then we would hope that my dad would go into the bedroom to watch whatever he wa was going to watch, so that we could watch USA and watch all those, you know, movies. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so we just had to that hope is that. Funny. Mom didn't want to watch Ben Hur during the weekend. <laughs> so I'm assuming she had it on VHS. Oh yeah, recorded or yeah. Yeah, it was that either was Ben Hur too. or Gone with the Wind. So those yeah. were her oh. two. Her so two, two, two yeah. VHS tapes needed to watch Gone with the Wind. I don't think yep. people understand how difficult this is. Yep. Yeah, yeah so. no, that so cool, <laughs> so fun to think about it. Going to the video store and hoping that the movie you wanted hadn't been rented by somebody else. And. Mm -hmm. It's just so different today when you, you know, my kid the other day was like, I want to watch this movie. 
it's on you know hbo max or something like that it's like okay you just go find it and click and you got it it's like man it would have been if when we were kids we say i want to see this movie and they're like okay we're about to go to you know two mainstream video rental places and then we might have to go to the mom and pop one just to see if they ordered it or not you know yeah and you better get there early on friday or the whole weekend shot because it's yep. coming back until sunday yep. so yeah it's so funny how different everything is um you know in such a short period of time you know in our and i'm sure you know that i'm sure i sound like an ancient person saying You're right like <laughs> i actually found um an old purse and it had my blockbuster card in it <laughs> sweet very cool that is very cool retro i'm like oh back in the day oh <laughs> do you remember when that happened when uh the rumbles of Netflix started and, and, in and, and of course, I don't know, a lot of people may not even realize Netflix would mail you the movies. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a streaming service and everybody was like, Oh, this won't last. And then Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy Netflix and they passed cause they thought it wasn't going to last. And now they're, you know, in the dust except for the one. And then I just think that's so funny when you go back and look at how, how yeah. quickly everything shifted. And yeah, then, you but see- now I was gonna say now it feels like things are going back more towards physical yeah and we're trying to get away from the streaming stuff yeah when i was um living on my own as a a young adult um i didn't have cable at all like i didn't even have basic cable i just had a tv and a and a dvd player and that Mm -hmm. was it so i would like rent like series from netflix because i had the plan where you could get three at a time you know (laughs) yeah that's the way um, to do it and i would rent series so that i would like binge watch you know the first dvd in the series and then send it in and get the second one or a movie or whatever yeah. it's so funny when you think about all this, the hoops we had to jump through to watch something yeah and how instantaneous it is now sometimes it might be the same day it came out you get to watch it on streaming but we used to have to wait six to eight months just to see a movie for out of the theater you know a year maybe yep. depending if it was super popular yep and then all the space it takes up if you were to purchase it or if you were recording, you know, the old days we recorded everything. So you'd have your VHS tape and it might be like Frankenstein and, um, you know, Gone with the Wind on a, however you recorded it or something. You just have totals, mixed genres and yep. just whatever yep. you were able to get in there and hit record when it happened. So, yeah, that's crazy how how much uh, how easy it is now to get a hold of these things. Yeah. So if you could make a movie or a show about any one of the projects that you've written, books that you've written, which one would you would like to see? I think the Goatman would be really cool to see because I just think it would be over the top. But I know there's some Goatman movies out there. But I bet you the best one would be Don Texas oh, yeah. as a TV show and mm-hmm. just have it stretched out. And you could do – you could mix years within a season and kind of jump around and flashbacks and inter- – interweave some of the stories and make it one package. I think that would be really cool um, just to see. And I think the scarecrow would be fun because, you know, some Mm -hmm. I've seen some scary um, scarecrows, but, you know, get something jeepers, creepers kind of like and running around and all the different things. I'd be able to get into the, because there's so much more I haven't put out yet. So there's a lot more I know in my head about what's going to go on. So I think Don Texas would probably make the best. What, What do you have one? Um, for me, I think I would like either Finding Heaven. I think that would make a good like movie. Um, That'd but, be a spicy movie. Yes. Yes, it would be. Um, the other thing I think that would make a really good show is there's a story I wrote for the most recent Books of Horror anthology. It's called Yellow mm-hmm. Jackets. Um, and it's, I don't want to say it's post-apocalyptic, but it's about these like, they're not aliens they're not creatures these beings that basically have like cyclones for faces and if you come face to face with them they like suck all your skin and everything off and like goes into their faces so i think that would be a cool series to do well, that would be fun to watch yeah because it is kind of like post-apocalyptic because people have to stay inside um mm-hmm. and then the creatures don't come out if it's raining so the only time humans can come outside without fear of running into these things is when it's raining. So you'd, you know, you'd have these people out celebrating in the rain because that's when the only time they could go yeah. out. 
So, yeah, that would be a fun. You could see that as a movie or a series because you could really do more and build on the mythology of the characters and the creatures and stuff. That would be really cool. Also, you and uh, Angelique, you guys, I mean, you've got the one out, but I have a feeling that you guys are going to have a ton of really cool anthologies out. I could see you guys doing a really fun anthology series where you jump around following your – this first one with Queens was really was really good, really well done with, I think, a lot of good stories in them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely beautiful stories. I loved every single one of them, except for mine. But, you know, Whatever. we all think our stories are not good. <laughs> I think um, uh, top to bottom, I thought that was a great collection and really well done. And I thought uh, a really good start because that was really the first one you guys released, right? Yep. Under Bludgeon Girls. Yep. Yeah. Sure so was. I think I thought it was uh, a very high bar you've set for yourselves in the future with the other stuff that you do. But I, I have no doubt that you guys are going to knock it out of the park every time. So yeah. but I really crossed. thought you guys did really good. Thank but yeah, that would be much. fun. Can you imagine that? Like a Queen's <laughs> anthology series or something? Yeah, kind of yeah, kinda like there. a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? American Horror Story. Kind of like yeah. that kind of a. Yeah, that would be kind of cool with all the different stories kind of interweaving and stuff. Yeah. Um, I know you guys, like I said, you guys are going to have some great stuff in the future too. So I think it's very, very cool what y'all are doing. Thank you. Now, do you prefer science fiction or fantasy? And do you have a favorite show or book? Boy, you know what? I forgot all of these questions that, that we had done this. <laughs> We've done this a little bit, and I get to not remember any of these. You know, it's funny. I love both of them. Um, I guess I would lean more towards science fiction, especially now as an adult. But when I was younger, I loved, I read fantasy nonstop. Really enjoyed Dragon Ants and, you know, Wheel of Time and all that stuff. But I do enjoy some Philly Dick in science fiction and Aliens and Predator and Stargate. Those are some of my favorite things now. So I don't know why. I have to say probably science fiction. I'm trying to think yeah. if there's something that's outside the box that would be a fun thing to point to and say, oh, I really enjoyed this. But I mean, if we could go to fantasy, I mean, you got Legend with, you know, Tom Cruise. That's a that's fun what movie. I was going to say. Yeah. And Tim uh, Curry and. And there's some great animated things. And I guess it kind of would emerge as the two science fiction and fantasy, but I think Wizards is a really good movie. And that came out, you know, in the 70s. And it's an apocalyptic uh, story with wizards and fairies. and But it's also got like this Nazi storyline in it and the bad wizards trying to capitalize the propaganda films of the Nazis and, and make evil rise again. And, um, it's obviously got overtones of Nazis and and Jews and, right. that kind of stuff, but it is it's beautifully animated. Uh, Ralph Bowski, you know, he did Lord of the Rings, which I love. I think Lord of the Rings is an amazing thing. So it's kind of hard to say. I I pick science fiction and I look over and I have all twenty seven versions of you know, Lord of the Rings on every. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's. <laughs> I always find it surprising when horror writers aren't a fan of either of those two because I think they all kind of go hand in hand. They do. You, can, you really can find the horror and everything, um, especially yeah. in those. So, and I loved seventies. Um, you know what's his name? Uh, Roger Corman. You know, he did all those mm -hmm. great low budget films, and he and he jumps on the backs of Star Wars and stuff, and they put out a lot of fun science fiction fantasy things. Beastmaster was a great movie growing up. I was going to mention Beastmaster as well. Yeah. So I mean, how, how that was like a, a constant. In rotation movie if you it was on every channel all the time it felt like yeah so um yeah i personally don't think i could pick between the two yeah um, it's kind of i don't think i did so you're right yeah because i'm a huge star wars fan i mean i have mandalorian mm -hmm. playing right now and i've said it before i watched the mandalorian both you know all seasons every weekend i have that playing as the background noise I'm reading um, Darth Vader stuff right now, so I'm kind of yeah. in that Star Wars vibe with you. Yeah, I mean, it is May the 4th, so May the 4th be oh, with you. Oh, that's true. That's yeah. true, <laughs> um, So, yeah, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Um, I am also, you know, I was addicted to Star Trek The Next Generation. I was just about to ask you about Star Trek to see if there was a, a, a battle. I'm sure we yeah. discussed this in other interviews with people. I was like, I wonder if you were like one or the other steadfast, like, 
But no, I like to hear that you like both because I think yeah. you should like both. Yeah, no, I definitely, I mean, Star Trek The Voyage Home is like one of my favorite movies. Yeah, that's a great um, movie. The, that, hello, computer. <laughs> so oh, it's like, like picks up the mouse and he's all like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you have to type? How quaint. And he's like, um, so yeah, I love science fiction. I love aliens and Predator and. But then I also love fantasy. I love Legend is one of my favorite movies. Beastmaster. I could watch Beastmaster like every day, all day. Um, yeah, that Sheena. Was so fun. Did you oh, ever yeah. see Sheena with Tanya Roberts? Yeah. Uh, that was another movie that I could watch over and over and over again. Um, uh, I Excalibur? Haven't... Are you Excalibur. Excalibur. Oh, my God. Lady Hawk. Oh, I love Lady Hawk. Yeah. Lady Hawk, such a great movie. I haven't really read too much science fiction and fantasy. Um, I think the most recent thing I've read fantasy wise would be Daniel Wolpe's Splatter Fantasy series that he just put out. Um, I've not read like Lord of the Rings or anything like that. Um, it's funny how dry a lot of the fantasy and science fiction is when you read it. I mean, it's yeah. just so dry. And then they create these beautiful movies and animated picture and series and stuff. And you're like, well, why can't it be more like that? Yeah. You know? So, but yeah, I, I really couldn't pick between the two. Um, I have so many favorites on both sides that I could just watch. I think you know? that's part of our generation though. Again, I think that shows how, you know, we're the same age and we know, we, we even though we grew up in totally different places and stuff, we all have that same kind of blueprint of what we got to watch and see and fell in love with. And yeah. I'm always happy when I hear people say that that that's how they grew up. I'm shocked when somebody will tell me that they haven't seen a movie that came out if they were alive at the time. Like, yeah. oh no, I never saw Raiders of the Lost Ark or Star oh, Wars. I've yeah. never seen. You know, it always blows my mind. I'm all like, I'm always like, well, did your parents not love you? Because <laughs> <laughs> Did you not see any of these amazing movies yeah. that were dirt cheap to go see at the time? But um, yeah, no, if you 100%, it's so fun to go back and, and occasionally stumble across when you forgot about. Yeah. And then you get to see it again with, you know, today's eyes and go, oh, God, this is terrible. But at the same time, it's like one of the greatest things ever because yep. it just brings back all those great memories and stuff. So Yeah. What was that movie? <sighs> I forget what that, you know, somebody just mentioned it on Facebook somewhere. Um, it was a science fiction movie in the 80s about these young kids. I think River Phoenix was in it. Um, and they Light took of the like, intruder? No, they took like this um, uh, carnival ride. One of those things you sit in and it spins around and they made a uh -huh. spaceship. And they end up going into space and like coming across these aliens. It's not Space Invaders, is it? No. What the heck is the name of that movie? I think I know what you're talking about. But yeah, there was a there was a series from like eighty four to eighty seven, and there was like a whole bunch of these um, coming of age stories with aliens, and uh, some were very like ghoulies and critters and a little more violent, and then some were like like you're talking about. I think. It's not last, no last starfighter wasn't that that was last starfighter was great though yeah that's uh, such a such an interesting take on video games yeah um the explorers explorers, the explorers. is the name of it yeah explorers yeah. and they go up and they like one of his friends like falls in love with the girl alien and then the father alien comes home and he's like this giant uh, they have to get back I'm to earth to yeah those were all really good those are all fun movies yeah, I'm trying to. There's another one in that same vein that was in that same time period too. So, but it was just Flight of the Navigator. Yeah, that's yeah, that's Flight a good of the one Navigator too. was a great one. Yeah, it's just funny because I and then when we hear they just don't make movies anymore that aren't just repeats and they could be repeating those at least. Those would be fun, you know, a little bigger yeah. budget and stuff like that. But it just feels like they had a much wide open uh, canvas for movies and stuff in the eighties. And I'm sure at the time everybody was complaining that they're just doing remakes again, but remakes and sequels, but um, it did feel like the eighties had way more. Um, they took more chances than they do now. Yeah. Yep. Um, I just, per I, like you said, I think, you know, horror and sci-fi and fantasy are all intertwined. Um you can break yeah. them out and you could be reading a, a strict fantasy book like Lord of the Rings and there's still horror. Mm -hmm. Like, was it Sauron? I always get Saruman and Sauron 
mixed up the eyed dude the mm-hmm. orcs like those are terrifying yeah you know um they these creatures that lived in the ground you know spiders the spiders in the woods and yep. you know and then you have shelob up in the in in mount doom where you know when they're trying to drop their in their shelobs there to eat them yep. so that Gollum um, himself is pretty Gollum, much- yeah exactly so yeah no all of it science of Moria. fiction yep science fiction you've got aliens you've got you know predator yeah, just those two are scary enough, but there's so yeah. many more. And I used to be – another thing that used to terrify me, um, and you talk about Dune, the original Dune, mm-hmm. the 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 Baron. He was yeah. terrifying to me. Um, and Khan from Star Trek. Oh, I don't yeah. know why Khan was always – It's because he put that thing in those guys' ears. Yes. It was so creepy. Yes, the thing in the ears yeah. was just like, I can't deal with this. <laughs> Which I really, yeah, that was such a brilliant movie. The second Star Trek, yeah, everything they did with that, yeah, because it because it's definitely got elements of everything. It's a lot of action, a lot of suspense, and and it's got that that underlying horrific thing because Khan is so, I don't know, almost the beast you know, the way he yeah. treats everybody and does everything. So, yeah, yeah so no, you- I think that I think that's great. Oh, so what did you think of the Star Trek um, the the reboot? So I haven't really watched recent ones because I'm not really into them. I'm a William Shatner is the captain in Star Trek. I was never really a fan of anything Star Trek after Shatner was no longer the captain. Um, But you like Next Generation. I love Next Generation. Yeah. Um, But I didn't like I didn't like Deep Space Nine. Um, That was my favorite. I never actually saw all of Next Generation, but I watched all of Deep Space Nine. So, yeah. Oh, I, I was so why. addicted to Deep to uh, Next Generation that I joined the Columbia House Video Club and got all of them on VHS. Sweet, that's a <laughs> lot of VHS tapes. <laughs> yeah, that's I think it only time. ended up being like the first two seasons, uh, but then they stopped doing that. But yeah, it was like, and I got the plates, the collector's plates from uh, what the heck was that? name of that i know company. what you're talking about but i don't remember the name of the company yeah I do, <clears throat> I do remember having to send out for them and stuff so yeah so yeah. um that, that's that's fandom yes yeah you were a yeah. big fan i was a big fan but yeah i never got into the um what was the, there was a movie just recently with picard and kirk in it i never watched that oh you didn't um, so you didn't see any of the next generation movies no no, just yeah. this show. Um, yeah, because there's like three or four after they kind of stopped doing start because you missed the Borg movies, and there's one with Tom Hardy as a as a clone of of Picard, which is kind of weird when Tom Hardy was nobody. You know, it's like one of his first roles. But uh, I don't know. You might enjoy Pine. I mean, Pine is really channeling Shatner. Yeah. So it's like watching a young Shatner run around and do things. Um, that first one I thought was pretty fun, but yeah, no, I totally get it. And I, I don't, I don't know. I think they they might actually already be looking to reboot it again. So just let it die I'm, already. <laughs> I know, right? So and as much as I love Star Wars, I really hope there's no more movies um, for Star Wars. I would love to see movies more in the vein of um, kind of the side projects. What's that one? Uh, Oh, the one that came out that were about them getting the plans for the de- to destroy the Death Star. What oh, Rogue One. Rogue One. If there was more movies like Rogue One, I think mm. would enjoy that. I would love to see a movie with General Grievous. I think he's a fascinating character. Yeah, I'd like to see something just focused on him and how he got to the way he got to, which mm. they may have done in the animated series, but I didn't watch it because it was a weird period of time when kid wasn't into it at the time. So yeah, we dodged it. So, but. I think Grievous is fun. I wouldn't mind seeing something that had a whole bunch to do with the Wookiees. You know, I wouldn't mind a little extra of that. Yeah, a and Wookiee I, movie would I would totally do a Wookiee. Um, and someone just told me that um I think it was Kim just told me I forget exactly how she phrased it, but there was a period of time where Wookiees were hunted for their fur. So they'd be like hunted and killed and like skinned. So kind that of like makes bears. sense. That there's a, that's a horror idea for you. Yeah. 
That would be terrifying. I couldn't imagine tracking down Wookiees because I assume, I guess there's got to be passive Wookiees, but every time we've come across them in the in the movies, they're always. And what's cool, if uh, like I always talk about the Darth Vader comic that Marvel put out when they when Disney bought Star Wars and Marvel and they started pumping out all these Star Wars comics, they have a Wookiee that's a bounty hunter and he's just like evil Chewbacca and it's pretty fun to read it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, of the Darth Vader stuff that happens from the time he becomes Darth Vader to right before he, uh, you know, what happens in uh, Return of the Jedi. Tons of stories that they keep putting out in comic book form, novel form that I would love to see on as a movie. Because, I mean, Vader's a cool character when he's handled correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Bounty Hunters are fun, too. I, we, you know, I don't know if they did a good job the Boba Fett TV show. I, I wasn't a big fan. But, I would have liked more Boba Fett um, before the Sarlacc pit. Yeah. This yeah, was all read after. Some, you know? I read some books um, a long time ago that were based on the on Boba Fett, you know, getting to that point. And those were way more interesting than, than what they yeah. gave us, you know, on the TV show. Yeah. Not that I didn't like the, Bo- the book of Boba Fett. I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it was like this time period i would like to see stuff from sure the time when Django gets killed to yeah yeah know. for sure let's see him become boba fett and all that yeah. stuff so yeah no i'm with you there and that's a fun thing about some of these series that have been going on for 30 40 years you know we could actually tap into those things and maybe see some of the things that we've always wanted because yeah. as they they burn out of like, instead of just giving us the same rebooted story you know, Star Wars one or Star Trek and, and redoing everything. Let's get something new out there. Yep. Exactly. What do you think about um the Orville? Do you have you watched that? No, I haven't watched that. I think you might like it. it's uh I think got, you had this discussion like last year or something. You were telling me about it before. It's basically <laughs> it's Star it's Star Trek. It's like hey I pitched Star Trek and they said no, so I'm making this movie called or this TV show called The Orville, but it's exactly what Star Trek is. <laughs> and it's funny and it's you know, it's got topical episodes kind of dealing with stuff that people deal with today, but you know, in their time frame and stuff and but it's got the time travel episode that star trek would always do and the spacecrafts and the different aliens and and it's uh it's a very interesting show i think it's uh if you like science fiction and you don't like all the other stuff that star trek does i think you might enjoy this because it's not star trek but it's got that familiarity that makes you feel like oh i i can watch this and not be completely overwhelmed with new information because it's familiar enough right that i can you know process everything and not feel like i'm having to take a you know a class to understand because sometimes i feel like that you sit down to watch a new science fiction show and you're like two episodes yeah. in and you have no clue what's going on because everything is so they're just information dumping everything on you yeah that you got up so so much technical stuff yeah i would definitely suggest the orbital for anybody who who enjoys star trek or the science fiction shows they will enjoy it and i I think it's three seasons and there might be a fourth one coming, but if they don't, you won't feel like you're left out. You know, so you won't feel like a cliffhanger. I don't remember it ending on a cliffhanger. So yeah, that's cool. So we have, um, I grabbed two covers of yours, uh, Dawn Texas collection, which is a great series. Um, And then silly rabbits, which the silly rabbits is your most recent release, right? Like full uh, length, yeah. For a novel thing, I did a collection in December called Smashing "Oh Right, Time, right. But, um, but that's the collection of short stories. So it just depends on what people like to read. But I think that's I love that cover. So yeah, that's I, a great cover. I it can really just stare is. at Goatman all the time, and I'm excited to uh, revisit and get the third one finished. Hopefully by the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Um. So do you got any new projects that you're working on? Anything that you might have new for? Texas Author Con? Uh, for Texas Author Con, I do have stuff I was hoping for. That I also had hopes that I'd have new stuff for scares. And I ended up with some new covers, but I didn't really, and new sizes, but I didn't really have anything new. But the plan is to have um, a part two to There's Something in the Water and a part two or an expansion of Kiss Me Where It Smells Funny, 
where both of those will either have a secondary novel or, you know, chat book to go with it, or I'm going to do a larger, um, you know, so that, that the entire, and put both together and then you'll both get a together. bigger book with both stories because uh, they tie together. Both of them have immediate um, sequels to tie together uh, the storyline that it makes. So, cause I, I, if I have any complaints with those shorter books, it's that they want more. So yeah. I thought, well, I'll revisit and I'll add more so that everybody's happy. But a lot of yeah. people like to just a quick read, you know, lunchtime read or a little book or something. Yeah. Um, see, I'm a, I'm a greedy reader. Uh, if, if it's a shorter book, um, like a chat book or something, I'm like, give me more, you know, I, I want more like, <laughs> Um, so I will always be like, I want more of this story when it's just a chat book yeah. or, you know, I'm with you too. Cause you, if you read a cool story, you always want more information. So. Yeah. And then, um, the service guys and I are working on a project that, um, the, the goal is to have it ready for Texas author con. So it'll be fun. Yeah. Cause all four of you will be there. Yeah, and that's kind of what we're doing. We're, we'll all four be there so we can have it released and everybody can get it signed. And uh, and it'll be a fun project that deals with the uh, apocalypse. So Yes, and you are, you're pestilence, aren't you? Yes, I've been yeah. told that many times. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I am pestilence. It's funny because I knew when we were talking about this, I'm like, you know, I bet you they gave pestilence to Eric. I knew it. <laughs> it was a blind draw, supposedly. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. But, no, and I think it'll be a fun project, and uh, and and we're all very close to, I think, being to the point where we are comfortable with what we've got, and it'll be good to go. So. Now, I know I asked this before, I think when we were talking with Chris Miller, is it going to be one book with all the stories, or are they going to be yeah. individual releases? One book? No, it'll be one book, have all four stories. Um, okay. Each uh, horseman will be... You know, there and then you'll have your own thing. And I guess in the future, if we wanted to split it up, we could, but um, we might just keep it in the book form. I'm not sure. I'm just kind of along for the ride and enjoying it. So it's just fun <laughs> to, to do stuff with them. I'm very, very like, much looking forward to reading those. I yeah. Really I mean, because it's going to be four different unique styles because all four of us kind of are totally different while doing the same kind of thing, you know? But yeah. Ken and Bach and. PC3 and Chris Miller and I, we all kind of have our different strengths. And, and even though we might be writing something in the horror realm, we all do it in such a different way. It's going to be a mm -hmm. fun way to do it. And then we have my covers here, Compulsions, which is my uh, book of dark erotic poetry. It's a great cover. Yeah. And then uh, the most recent thing that's out is uh, Queens of Death, which is an anthology of uh, queen horror. Um, which includes yourself and a bunch of other people. Yeah, Annenbox in that one too, I think. And, Mike Annenbach uh, is in that. Yep. Yeah, Michael there's R. a lot. Of, uh, it was fun too because at scares uh, seven or so of the writers were there. Yep. I know we missed uh, Kenzie. Kenzie, she left, yeah. She left right before um, some of us got the copy, so we weren't able to get her to sign it. But it was fun to see the other writers and and have them sign the book, and chit chat about the stories and stuff. So yeah. Yeah, I think you guys did such an amazing job on that collection. So yeah, it was. Uh, you know, we had two from the UK, Nat Whiston and Ashley Lister, um, are over in the UK. So it was kind of a bummer. Um, yeah, but could... I think that's also cool that you did that—that that you brought in such talented writers from over there and got them included in the set. And it's really strong lineup. I mean, people yeah. should go look and check out the the list of writers that are in this one. It's it's a lot of of up and comer and popular and it's just a good mix of everything yeah yeah and that was the first release from bludgeon girls press with um you know me and angelique jordana started um coming this summer in june we are publishing melancholia by sumiko salson which is um her book of horror poetry um if you don't know sumiko um they are a Bram Stoker nominee. So Yeah, I was going to say, it's really cool. And it seems to be making a bit of a push. I mean, a year ago, I could point to you and Candace and Mike, and I think I would start drawing a blank on poetry, but there have been some notable names over the last, you know, three or four months. And then, like you said, you guys in the summer, that you guys are, people are actually starting to put out some of this horror poetry. 
So yeah, I think it's, it's cool. Yeah, it's really great. It, it's funny because I was um, I went to the Blood Brown Books um, panel at Scares, mm -hmm. um, and Joseph Sales. I always say Sales, but it's Sale. Um, was there, and he had mentioned that oh. Um, I wish there was more horror poetry or more cross genre poetry. Um, so I ended up giving him a, a copy of compulsions and then, um, you know, it's funny that all of a sudden Angelique was saying, Hey, Sumiko Salson wants us to publish their poetry book, their horror poetry. So I'll be able to tell him, Hey, look, there's more horror poetry. Yeah, and you guys <laughs> will be the place to go. Cause you'll have, some of the bigger names, some of the big, the, the, the big talent of, of that genre. Cause it is a, I think it's a specialty. I, I don't think it's something that I hear people say they're going to sit down and do it, but I've only seen a few people execute it well. Yeah. And I think you guys are going to corner the market on some of these um, that you're publishing. So I think that's kind of cool too. Yeah. And I have another project that's actually um, a mix of prose and poetry. I'm writing the poetry and the other person is writing the prose. That's um, cool. Yeah, so I can't say who it is right at the moment, um, but hopefully that will be out before the end of the year. It won't be ready for Texas AuthorCon, but um, yeah, I'm really interested to see how that is received because um, I don't think I've ever seen anything written in po prose and poetry. Yeah, I'm trying to think. There's a... I want to say Annenbach talked about it, but I don't know if he's actually ever done it. And his are collections anyway, so I could see how maybe he slipped in some poetry. But yeah, yeah. it does sound, if not 100% uh, unique, it's pretty unique. You know, there might only be one or two other ones out there. So, right. Yeah, it'll be very cool to see who you're working mm -hmm. with in this project when it comes out. Yeah. Um, so besides uh, Texas AuthorCon, uh, where can folks find you? Well, I'm on Amazon and uh, they can find me on Facebook and I'm going to have a, a website up, probably big cartel soon. Still kind of back and forth on what I want to do there. I kind of want to go back to my website and get it spoofed up again, but then I'm like uh, so much work and I, mm. maybe it's just easier just to have a storefront with big cartel and, I'm going to be at a bunch of events. So, you know, Texas Southern Con, I'm going to be at uh, Frightmare in Dallas in two weeks, which probably might be after this is released. So maybe I see you there, maybe I don't. And then uh, what do we have? Uh, I'll be at Scares 4 in St. St. Louis. Louis. Yep. And I'll TBR be at TBR Con. TBR in Tennessee. And of course, Texas Southern Con in July. And then there's a couple other little events that I'm looking at, maybe trying to do that at a local, but I don't know for sure yet. I'm still trying to figure all that out. So, yeah. but I feel like I've taken a big step. I did one event or two events last year that were large. And this year I'm, yeah, I'm shooting for five or six and then we'll see how next year goes. But yeah. it'd be coming nice to do it, more Coming events. out of your shell. Cause you started with texas author con when there was just a 14 that was your first event right yeah it was a saturday event or sunday event so it's even weirder it was sunday in the middle of the day in the middle of nowhere yeah. and i thought nobody's gonna come and then everybody came and it was steady and it was fun and the authors that showed up were fun and yeah no it was it was a uh, it was a it was the most pleasant surprise and then for texas author con to grow the way it has every time we talk about it i'm always blown away how it started so small and how big it got in year two and how big it's going to be in year three. And there's yeah. so many cool genres and so many cool writers. And there's just so much there for everybody to go and maybe find a new book or a new, you know, sub genre or just hang out with everybody and chit chat and stuff. I just think it's going to be fun. So. Yeah. I will also be at Texas author con uh, and TBR con. Um, and hopefully if I get a table, author con next year in williamsburg i know i know <laughs> that's uh nerve-wracking yeah but virginia is no. always nerve-wracking trying to get that table the way it's set up so i know i wish they wouldn't hype it up so much like you know i wish they would say like hey you know may 18th we're selling the tables and then like okay you know do like periodic reminders not like this countdown that joe ripple's been doing on the 
I get what he's doing. I understand I why it. he's doing it, but there, yeah. that's an event that doesn't need it doesn't need a cheerleader because it's a, such a fun event. Everybody wants to go, so yeah, yeah. It just it's a very uh, anxiety do- inducing way of going yeah. about everything. So yeah, um, yeah. No, I hope uh, I hope to go to scares next year as well, but you know, it's just one of those things where you don't want to talk about it till. It's a reality because then you'll be bombed. You're not going. So yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, you can find things on Amazon. Queens of Death is also on Barnes and Noble, so that's wide um, through Ingram. Um, but like Compulsions and Finding Heaven, those are on Amazon. Um, I also have some shorts on Godless um, that I co-wrote um, with Todd Love, and then I have my bisexual zombie mm-hmm. um, alien orgy story um on godless as well and that's with yvonne right that's that's his series uh mick collins mick collins that's right yep sorry, mick collins sorry, started man. it yeah mick collins started it he wrote the first two um then matthew vaughn wrote one reek feel wrote one that's why i just remember vaughn's cover yeah i mean they're James... all cold cover so yeah james g carlson uh wrote one and then i wrote one and then mick ended it which very I was cool. very sad about. <laughs> yeah, but so go to uh, go to Godless and grab all those copies and um, Amazon, grab everything, or come see us at an event. I know yeah. we enjoy when people visit and come see us at the tables. So yeah, yeah, I got to say, you know, Scares was a really good event for me this year. Um, I was actually surprised. I mean, Texas Authorcon was my first off event ever as mm-hmm. an author, um, so I was kind of like, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's hard to gauge anything. Um, yeah, um, but this year at Scares, I was pleasantly surprised that, you know, I did as well as I did. Well, you have quality stuff there, so, and you had more. I know, I mean, you guys had a lot more than you did when you were at Texas Authorcon the first yep. time. So you'll have plenty there this year, too. So yep. it, it should be good. Um, but yeah, Scares scares was, uh, was a fun event. Yep, absolutely. It always is. Always is. So yeah, we will see you at the event. We'll have a link to the Eventbrite so you can mm-hmm. go get your ticket. Um, it's a free event, so you don't have to pay. Um, but we, you know, it would be nice if you grab a ticket so that way we can count attendees. Um, and I think there's prizes if you get a ticket too. Yeah, I th- I'm pretty sure they're going to do the prizes again, and that's a good thing. Show up. It's a free event, but with that ticket, you'll get something in exchange most likely yep. at least you get thrown into a drawing for something mm-hmm. yep so we'll we'll see you there and thanks for joining us take it easy <laughs>